Boilers only run as well as we care for them. Water levels, water quality, and water hammer, three critical factors that determine safety, efficiency, and longevity. Today, we're breaking down the essentials every operator needs to know. Well, we're gonna be talking about water level today on uh, fire tube boiler. Stephen, maybe just walk us through real quick, I mean, about where the water's at, and then, uh, you know, actually, how do we sense where the water's at? Yeah. So this is a McDonald Miller typical uh, control on, on a, lot of, a lot of boilers. This one, we happen to have a, a 7B head on here for modulating feed. You can put a 5B on this one for, for on-off control. But there's a line right here in the middle of the body, and that's the normal water level. Okay. what that line is. So the manufacturer will tell you where it needs to be. Um, if you, if you, you know, you, you buy the, the boiler with that on there, they'll put it where it needs to be. So you can see that line is right here. So you want mm -hmm. the normal water level just about, just a little below halfway up the side glass is where you want it. Mm -hmm. and, and this you know, particular control has a, a float mechanism in there. So it's going, it floats up and down as the water level goes up and down. And there's a slide control in here uh, that, that is sending a signal out telling the, the, the feed water valve where the water's at, open the feed water valve up, close the feed water valve. That's yeah. what we're Kind of like the old toilet bowl. It, just thing. exactly like it's it. Like the toilet bowl. Exactly like it. Always go to the toilet. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is actually above the tubes. It is. Okay. Yeah. So, obviously, water getting below the tubes is not a good thing. Not a good thing. And, and even the second cutoff yes. is going to be above the tubes, correct? Yes. This line here is the first low water. Uh -huh. So there, that, that line is the normal water level. So you got about inch and three quarters there. That's the, sec that's the first low water cutoff. So this thing has another switch in here where it will shut the burner down. Mm -hmm. If something happens and this fails and doesn't shut the boiler off, the water continues to drop, we have a second low water cutoff probe in the top of the boiler and it's got water on it. As soon as the water drops off of it, then it kicks out and drops the water out. Let's just say that it doesn't, the first and the second, do not sense the water. And that can happen for various reasons. But what actually happens? The, the water level will continue to drop because it's not telling the feed pump to come on or mm -hmm. it's got the feed water valve closed. Mm -hmm. And when it continues to drop and gets below those tubes, because again, that second low water cutoff the water is still above the tubes. Not a whole lot, but it's still above the tubes. It continues to drop when, it, when that tube is exposed uh, and doesn't have water on it, because that water is, is strictly a, uh, an insulator, mm -hmm. keeping that tube from burning up. So, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, you're getting the heat transfer, the, the gas is coming through the tubes, going into the water, creating steam. When that water gets below that tube, that tube is gonna overheat. Nothing to transfer the heat to, so it's gonna overheat and, and you know, it won't take a very long time when it continues to drop, it'll start melting those tubes out. They'll start to warp first and they'll, they'll sag, but then they'll eventually blow and you'll have water going out the back door of the boiler. Is, is that a situation where you have a, um, an ex explosive type situation? If, if where that happens is where the water gets down real low mm -hmm. and like the Morrison tube starts to glow red because there's no water on it. Right. And then for whatever reason, this pops loose and you throw a surge of water in it and that water is going to expand 16 times in terms of steam it's going to expand as soon as it goes in there that's when you have a burst and something gives somewhere it's yeah. going to blow something up so pretty critical obviously to make sure that you have some very very critical of, uh... that's why you have blowdowns on them and you have daily blowdowns to blow those things down to make sure you keep that sediment out of there flushed out of the boiler that, that daily maintenance is absolutely critical now, I know there's some different types of uh, McDonald Millers that uh, actually do not have a float. Yeah, they have now their, their probe type. They've got several probes in there, and they're, they're doing the same thing as the one up top up there. Uh -huh. They're sensing the water. And then you've got ones that are, that are you know, they're, they're just level transmitters that are they're sensing the, uh, the level and sending the signal out and doing the, doing the same thing. Well, from a maintenance standpoint, you definitely want to make sure that you're watching the um, McDonald Miller here. Blow that thing down every day to keep that sediment out and flushed out of the boiler and that thing will stay clean. It'll, it'll operate forever. Today at Boiler U, we're gonna talk about water. Water's critically important for your boiler, but not just that we put some in there. 
we've got to make sure we've got good water quality. And the type of water quality we're talking about today is hardness in water. Hardness in water is calcium and magnesium that comes from whatever your water source is, and they're terrible for your boiler. So in order to make sure we're not putting hard water in our boiler, we're going to test it daily using a water softener test kit. So I'm going to demonstrate that with two bottles of water, one that's soft, one that's hard, and, and I don't know which is which. Our water hardness test kit consists of three basic components, a buffer, an indicator, and a reagent. The first thing we're going to do is collect some water. Unfortunately, I've already done that. So we're going to get a sample, and we're going to take our little measurement tube, and we're going to fill it up to the appropriate line. Fourteen point six milliliters for indication in grains per gallon, which is what we're looking for. The buffer, five drops of buffer. Give her a swirl. Scoop of indicator powder. It's like making Kool-Aid. And guess what? This sample was soft. That's, we can tell that because it's blue. The second sample we know is untreated because I had one of each and we already found the soft sample. So I'm going to rinse this first to make sure that we get rid of any residual soft water. Fill it to the mark. One, two, three, four, five. Give her a swirl. Now when I add the indicator powder, we see it's not blue. And this is bad. This means that we're putting undesirable minerals in our boiler. But in order to properly set up the softener, um, or to know how long uh, hardness has been bleeding through, we're going to want to quantify or figure out how much hardness is in our sample. So we do that by adding the reagent and we count the drops. One, two, three, four, five. I give it a swirl. Six. It's turned blue. So that means our incoming water probably has between six and seven grains per gallon of hardness. Now, you may ask what's a grain because that's sort of an abstract term. But if you've ever had a BB gun and you're familiar with BBs or kids that leave them laying around, a BB weighs about five to six grains. So every gallon of this untreated water going into your boiler is one BB of minerals that will deposit somewhere in your boiler. So if you're making up 10,000 gallons of water a day, you can imagine that that's a massive amount of minerals in very short time. It's critical to test your water softener daily. We want to have a sample point at the outlet of the water softener where we know we're getting a good fresh sample. We can even let that run for a few seconds to flush minerals or metal ions out. Um, the other thing that we want to document when we do our water softener is the number of gallons remaining before regeneration and which tank we're operating on. That can give us a history of information so that if we have to troubleshoot the softener in the future, um, we have those pieces of the puzzle. That sound you're hearing behind me is water hammer. Water hammer is a phenomenon that we can encounter in many different situations in a steam system and it can actually be quite dangerous. So we want to be aware of it, what causes it, and how we can prevent it. Water hammer occurs anytime we've got a mix of cold water in a line and steam. Um, that can happen when a line is not in use and we valve in the steam, or it can happen when we're blowing down uh, the low water cutoff or bottom blowdown on a boiler. Um, and we can prevent it by ensuring that we get ample time for a line to warm up before we uh, apply uh, high pressure steam. And we're going to show an example 
in some glass pipe here to, to really in, illustrate what's happening inside that pipe when it occurs. This glass pipe is actually completely flooded with water that's actually cold to the touch. So when we've got flooded piping like this, it's a perfect scenario for water hammer. So I'm gonna introduce steam to this piping and we're gonna see what the results are. What we're seeing here is the introduction of steam to this cold pipe. Um, anytime we allow that steam to flow into a cool area, we've got a potential for hammer. And so we'll watch this as it occurs. So what we're seeing here are shock waves generated by the absorption of the heat by the steam and the basic implosion of the water into that space. So it's actually the water refilling the space displaced by the steam that's causing the hammer sound. And we can do that, we can recreate that again one level lower. One of the most dangerous places that steam hammer can occur is in steam piping, especially in a header. Uh, because of the large internal volume, a massive amount of energy can be released when we have hammer occurring. So to prevent that, we use proper piping and trapping on a steam header. Here we have what we call a drip leg. The drip leg provides a low point for condensate or water in the header to occur and the steam trap allows that condensate out and back to the condensate return system. So if we've got an area that's not properly trapped, it can hold a large amount of water and generate a phenomenal amount of force if hammer occurs. Another place that we can have hammer occurring is in piping during the blowdown of the boiler. But we need to blow down the boiler, so there's a way to prevent that from happening. Hammer can occur in our blowdown piping when we're doing our daily low water cutoff test. So the way that we open this valve can protect us from that. The appropriate way to do this blowdown is to first crack this valve in order to allow that steam line to preheat. Once that line's warm, we've eliminated the possibility of hammer and we can open that the rest of the way. These basics aren't just checkboxes. They're what keep your people safe, your plant efficient, and your boiler running for years. For more training, check out Boiler University. And for parts, visit BoilerWarehouse.com.